So I ask you to turn with me as we prepare to consider God's Word to Acts chapter 18. And I'm actually going to back up a little bit and read from verse 8 down through verse 21. So listen as I read God's Word. Acts chapter 18. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many people in this city, many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio, the proconsul of Achaia, uh, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, this man is persuading people to worship contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names in your own law, see to it yourselves, I refuse to judge these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all seized Soth Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of his brothers and set sail for Syria with him, Priscilla and Aquila, at Concrea, he cut his hair, for he was under a vow. And they came to Ephesus, and he left them there, but he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined, but on taking leave from them, he said, I will return to you if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. Let's pray. Lord, we look to you as we always do when we open your word because we do it with a sense of gravity in the seriousness and richness of your word. That as we open it up, it's not simply um, a religious book. It's not simply the opinions of religious men of the past. It's not simply suggestions, but it is your word. And we know from what you have revealed that every word is profitable. And so God, as we take up this section of the narrative that unfolds here in Acts 18, I pray, O oh God, that you would help us this morning uh, to receive the purpose for which you've given it, that we would uh, glean from it those things that reveal um, your great glory, your great person, and your great power, Lord, that would make us uh, be a people who are confident in your wisdom, confident in your purposes, and depend on you. Lord, grant us um, uh, ears to hear in this time. Help, O oh Lord, that I would speak your word faithfully and clearly. In Jesus' name, amen. As we take this up, not only are we continuing in Acts where we left off, but I've called this sermon, The Faithfulness of God. And that is intentional because it's very important for us to keep this in mind. The scripture is given, and many times it's stated for us in this way. You read throughout the Old Testament and throughout the New, in order that they may know that I am the Lord God. These things are given in order that we might know Him and be found in Him who has eternal life. So, though there is much that is personal and much that is practical and much that is instructive as to how we live, let's not lose sight of the fact that this is God's Word that first and foremost makes God known. He is the main character of the Scriptures. He is the hero of it all. It starts in the beginning God. You know, as you come all the way to the end, it's sort of, Lord Jesus, come quickly. There is a, a, such a, a God-centered emphasis, and we have a tendency today uh, uh, to focus on those things which seem to speak to our daily lives, which is valuable. 
and we want to make note of those things. But in the process, we kind of make God secondary. Remember, God sent His Son to seek and save the lost. Jesus says, all that my Father has given to me will come to me. We, we've got to see in the unfolding of the Scriptures the revelation of God, who He is, in His person, in His power, the unfolding nature of His plan that culminates in the salvation of His people and by His grace, our eternal felicity in His presence as opposed to those who will be under His eternal wrath. We are the ones who change. We are the ones who waver and shift with the winds and the shadows. Governments rise and fall. Kingdoms rise and fall. But our God is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. And we have that confidence. All good things come from Him whom there's no shifting or shadow or wavering. That's why I remind you as we start this out, I want us to, to see this um, when we see the trustworthiness of God, uh, the first thing we see is a testament to God's faithfulness. Now, by way of uh, scriptural reminder, we are told this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 to 13. Some of you will know these verses, but listen as I say them, because I always remind myself of this when I'm reading the scripture, remind you, just because something's familiar doesn't mean we should tune it out. Maybe it's familiar because it's oft repeated because it is significant, because it is something that we need to take note of. It says this, this is a trustworthy saying or a saying that is trustworthy. If we died with him, because when by faith you're, we're united to Christ, the, we have died to the flesh and we are raised to walk in newness of life. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, now note this, endurance means it ain't easy. It means there's tribulation and trials and hardship. If we endure with him, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. But listen, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. That is the faithfulness of God. And though we, as his people, would strive often to be as faithful as possible, who achieves that perfectly among us here? Who is without sin this week? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because it would be inappropriate for anyone to do so. Uh, but the reality is, as, as faithless as we are, and, and at times we will say, uh, make a promise to someone, and then that promise we don't meet it. Because maybe we're hindered because uh, we were going to help them financially, but some other burden came up and we can't, or we promised to be somewhere, but there was a car accident and the roads were simply blocked and we're stuck. There are things that keep us from fulfilling promises we make to other people. That is never the case with God. There, there's no unforeseen accidents. There's no things outside of our power. Yes, outside of His power. No. So that when He makes a promise, He is absolutely able to fulfill it. Which is why when we hear the promise of the gospel, that all who come to Him, He will not cast out. That is so encouraging because the person who knows they have lived a life steeped in sin doesn't have to think that when I come in Christ, He will not accept me. Because what does the scripture say? He who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. And so we begin to, we understand the mercies of God. Uh, we rely on His mercy. We rely on His grace. We, rely, we rely on the righteous standing that is accounted to us because of Christ. Now, by His grace, we are made new. 
And as those who are made new, we are indwelt by the Spirit and thus enabled and to a degree guaranteed to make progress. We are those who will be being transformed from degree to degree into the image of the Son. For some of us, not super fast. But nonetheless, it's, it's a process. And in that process, sometimes as we've made a few steps forward, we make a step back, don't we? There are times we think, I thought I overcame that. I thought I dealt with that. I thought I was done with that. And yet it got me again. Or I did it again. And even then, we're met with mercy. He is faithful. And in his faithfulness, what does he say to his children? In 1 John 1, 9, we know it well. If we confess our sin, when we come to Him in general, genuine, genuine, earnest confession and repentance, it says, He is faithful and just. Thankfulness, his, thankfully, His forgiveness to me and to you is not dependent on our faithfulness. If we were entirely faithful, we wouldn't be much in need of forgiveness. But He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that beautiful? And so we come uh, to a faithful God. And there are elements within this passage that remind us of His faithfulness that's unabated and unhindered. Now listen, just because bad things happen to us does not mean He was unfaithful in any way. Many of the apostles were arrested. The early apostles were beaten and imprisoned. James was killed with the sword. We understand that to mean likely beheaded. Okay, so bad things, by our definition of bad things, happen, but God is still faithful. Why? Because when James is beheaded, God receives his soul in Christ into his presence. God is faithful to his promises. There is eternal life, but we don't live this life forever. So note this with me. Uh, We come into this passage being aware of a promised protection. In chapter 18, verse 10, Uh, God had spoken to him. Now, uh, the sense seemed to be that again things were stirring up. And this was Paul's regular experience. He goes into a town. He comes and tries to meet the Jewish community, gather in the synagogue, seeks to articulate to them from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. He's the one we were waiting for. Then righteousness... A right standing with God cannot be found by our law keeping because we can't keep the law entirely. But the righteousness of God is reckoned, counted to us in His Son by faith. And, and, and these kinds of things were, would stir their minds and many of them would get antagonistic and it often resulted in serious problems, sometimes bodily harm. We're we're aware as we search the scriptures uh, of occasions, for example, and I read for you Acts chapter 14. Now, today we're in 18. As an obvious statement, 14 comes before 18. So these are things that happened to him before in his experience. Uh, The Jews, 14, 19. The Jews from Antioch and Iconium, having been persuade, uh, having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city. Okay, so one place where Paul was sharing the gospel and ministering, what happened? They gathered around and stoned him, pelted him with rocks till he appeared dead. Then they dragged him out of the city and walked away. Now I ask you, was God unfaithful? Of course not. 
Now, listen, maybe there's a tension that arises in our minds because we think, well, why did he allow that to happen? Remember, the wise are the secret things known to God. That God is in, in control as they gathered around him. What they thought had killed him, God didn't let that kill him. Man ultimately cannot determine when someone lives or dies. That is in God's hands. He has the power over life and death. He can take someone such as Lazarus who has already been in the grave for four days. And he can call him out alive. It is all entirely in God's hands. And, and then if you go down to chapter 16, verse 22, it says, The crowd joined in attacking them. The magistrates tore the garments off them. So you're thinking about that. You're out there and you're trying to serve God, sharing with them the gospel of salvation, the truth that it is in Christ. These people lay hold of them and they rip their clothes off of them. This is, I mean, this is the kind of brutality I think few of us have faced. It does still take place in the world in which we live today. It does. For a long time, we've been somewhat insulated from persecution against the church. But there's little pockets and uh, aspects of, of persecution that are rising in our day in ways we haven't seen it before. And it's going to be interesting to see what God's purposes are, whether he's going to allow it to, at this point to continue to get worse or whether there's going to be a bit of a pullback, I don't know. I cannot predict, but I know this. In all things, he is faithful. And in all things, he's called us dependent upon him to endure and to persevere. It says they not only ripped off their clothes, and, and it, it says further, Verse 23, and when they had inflicted many blows upon them. This is, this is very difficult. And so it's into this circumstance that, that, that Paul is now ministering in the, the church here in Corinth. And he, he has been met with tremendous opposition from the Jewish leaders, and so he's gone out and he started a house church in, in, right next door to the synagogue, and it's not unreasonable for his heart and mind to say, you know what I think's going to happen next? I'm in for a whooping. You know, someone's going to come and beat me down again. You know, maybe with rods, which happened to them at times, they would beat them with, with wood or iron rods, tearing their clothes off or stoning. None of it, as you're sitting there, you're thinking, I can't wait. No, you're, you're thinking the whole time, oh no. And so it seemed that there was this tendency or temptation uh, uh, for Paul to say, maybe it's time to hit the road. You know, I think God can handle this. And there's no question, God can handle anything. The uncertainty is what role he would have us play. Sometimes we think the moment hardship comes, you know what? I think God is trying to tell me to jump ship. I think he's telling me to get out of Dodge. This is what comes into people. Things are hard. I think God is giving me a hint I need to leave. That's not always the case. Because what they were doing and what Paul was doing through his ministry was exactly what God had called him to do. And he got met with opposition and met with hardship. And what was he told to do? Continue through it. Persevere through it. Now in this case, God comes to him and says, as I, as I mentioned, and, and let me read actually verse... Uh, 10 and 11, it simply says this, or, or verse 9 and 10, Paul said to him in a vision, the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid to go on speaking. Do not be silent. Keep going. Keep doing what you're called to do. And look what he says on this occasion, for I am with you and no one will attack you to harm you. Right. The, the phrasing on there that maybe doesn't quite come through means that no one is going to assault you with bodily harm. 
Is he going to be attacked in other ways? Yes. But he knows, he, God is telling him this, nobody's going to lay a hand on you. Now here's my question to you. How can God say that with certainty? But what if, they're, what if, if the people get angry enough, and, it's in, and they, it's in their heart, and it's the desire of their will to get him, God can't stop people from acting out their will, can he? Or can he? Yes, indeed, he can. What he's saying is, listen, God can restrain men from having the strength to act out their impulses. Some examples of that, we go back to the angels who had visited in Sodom and Gomorrah. And they're staying in Lot's house and these men were attacking with, with, with horrible perverse intent. And what did God do? He struck them with blindness so that their ordinary ability to function and to potentially break in and do what they wanted to do was hindered. He stopped them by giving them practical limitations and inabilities. If he wants, in some battles, he threw stones from heaven. In some battles, he caused confusion among the enemies of Israel so that they suddenly decided to turn and start killing each other and as the children of Israel just kind of watched as they, as they all killed each other down to the last man well um, sometimes we don't grasp how absolutely great God is how absolutely sovereign he is the scope of his dominion we limit it in so many ways and we exalt the somehow strength and ability and vitality of men and don't understand listen if God doesn't allow a man cannot draw a breath he can't rise out of the bed we, we don't take note of everyone's utter dependence because of the general mercies of God that prevail. But we, when we see this, he, he says, no one will attack you to harm you, so don't fear. And I, like, uh, I love what it says, uh, uh, for I have many people in the city. And then verse 11 says, and he stayed a year and six months. In other words, simply, he stayed. And he kept speaking. He took God at his word. But even though he had clearly taken God at his word, and he stayed and taught, persecution, some kind of persecution, was still permitted. They came against him. They verbally attacked him. They bring him for false accusations to Gallio. And so we see that in verse 12 and 13. Uh, persecution was permitted. When Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. He's teaching different than our teaching. It's not what we, norm we accept, it's not what we understand. And we've already looked at this in the past. Paul says, under the inspiration of the Spirit, in so many places, things that were hidden for ages and generations have now been revealed to the saints by his holy apostles. We have this progress of revelation in the person of Christ. Remember, as Moses served a role, it said in Deuteronomy 18, uh, Moses said, there will arise a prophet like me who will speak to you. Him you must listen to. Whoever does not listen to him, of him it will be required. And then we move forward to the preaching in the book of Acts. And it says, he is the one, Jesus Christ is the one that was being spoken of by Moses. Then we also have those interesting words at the transfiguration, don't we? Who is there in radiance? Jesus, for a moment, suddenly uh, his, a measure of his glory that was veiled by his humanity, his flesh, 
is, is somehow pulled back a bit, and in an impossible description, they say, you know, he's radiant, resplendent, his clothes are wider than is even possible with the best of bleach and the best of washers. You know, they don't have an exact way to describe it. It's so amazing. And who appears with Jesus? Moses and Elijah. You have that representative of the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets, they all testify to and speak of Christ. And in the presence of them, the Father... Overhead, his voice thunders from heaven and he says what? This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Wait a second. Well, what about Moses? And what about the law? Those things were pointers. Those things were pre preparers. Christ had come. He was the one that it was pointing to. And he would bring an end to the old covenant. He would fulfill in himself the law and establish in his blood a new covenant. And that we would come to understand the salvation of God is by grace through faith to everyone who believes. Jew and Gentile alike. But God allowed this persecution. Just for those who, who like history, um, just a, a little interesting side note. I never know how much to add because time is always limited. But Gallio here happens to be uh, the brother of Seneca, the famous Stoic philosopher who has uh, written many things. And so um, he, he comes from a very well-to-do and a very influential family. And God... Uh, uses him here in this place. It's interesting also to note this. This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. Well, uh, contrary to Roman law or contrary to Jewish law? Where are you getting at here? It, they, they were in seemingly intentionally unclear because you got no grounds to bring him to the tribunal if he's breaking your own religious laws, that's not something the Roman tribunal is going to punish. But they thought, let's, by skillfulness of rhetoric and careful presentation and the abundance of our group saying strong things against this man, we're gonna get, we'll sway this guy to punish him. But the problem is this, though in previous occasions... God allowed them to stir up the crowds and to stir up the magistrates to strip them and beat them. On this occasion, God had promised it's not going to happen. And so though men may think they're going to achieve some sort of victory, they're going to prevail in this, they weren't. And it's not simply because their argument was, was seen through by Gallio, which it was, but why was Gallio so astute and attentive? Why did he see through it? Uh, please see who's orchestrating all of these things. God's working through the intelligence of men, through the intentions of man, even through the laws of men and circumstances, working all things together in the fulfilling of his designs and purposes, such that every word of God proves true. It's amazing. And the Jews themselves, uh, uh, as they tried to present it, they're persecuting him and bringing this attack on him. And, and remember, they did not understand. Galatians 2.15 says this, We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. That's what Paul says to the Galatians. And in, in that he's using the common phrase that a Jew would have. And he's writing to Galatians, most of whom are sinners. Now, when he says we are Jews by birth we are, and, and not Gentile sinners, the Gentiles should not immediately rise up and say, how dare you call us sinners? They don't need to do that because realistically, what should their heart say? Oh yeah, we were sinners. You know, uh, We sing that saved a wretch like me but we never like to think of ourselves as having been such. And it, 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 yet we know, 
verse 16 of Galatians 2, that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified in his sight. And this is one of the things that people oft confuse, and, I'm just, and if we had time, we could unpack it. I'd certainly be happy to interact with you in this way. Are we saved by faith or by works or by a combination of those things? Well, the verse I read made it very clear. We are not saved by works. Correct? We are saved by faith. Now, when you read James, it starts to seem to say we're not saved by faith alone. But if you read the phrasing in James, he says... I will show you my faith by my works. So so the the challenge that often has is this. Listen, we are saved by grace through faith alone, and that is not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. We contributed nothing. We are saved by grace. Note that. But the grace of God that saves us, when we get to Ephesians 2.10, I often say, just brother, keep reading the rest of that verse. For, for we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which He determined beforehand that we should walk in them. So in other words, those that by grace through faith he saves, he has, he has so united us to Christ that we are the workmanship of his hands and a new creation and that this transforming faith has been worked in our life is shown by the obedience that we then manifest sanctified by the Spirit for obedience unto Christ. Our obedience does not earn anything towards our salvation. Salvation is secured by Christ. It is attributed to to us by faith. The works are the proof that we have that saving faith. Okay? So just put those pieces clear in our mind. But Romans 3 says it this way, very important. Now, whatever the law says, even this is Paul writing, so you know what Paul was saying to them. It speaks to those who are under the law. So you got all this law. Here's what it says. And it gives them all of these requirements to which how many of them were without sin? How many obeyed every single word of the law? You know, not one of them. And J- because James does say, whoever offends in one point is guilty of all. You, you broke the law, you're a lawbreaker. You didn't break that one and that one, but you broke this one, you're still a lawbreaker. Listen, the, the point of it is this. Now, whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, Romans three nineteen, so that every mouth be stopped. Every mouth be stopped. Even those who, well, they're Gentile sinners. All right, you were the Jews who received the law. And that law comes to you and you look at it and then you look at yourself and you put your hand over your mouth. No bursting, uh, boasting, no I deserve, none of that. It goes on to say even, even further, um, for, the, for by the works of the law, this is, uh, the, I want to finish reading verse 19. Every mouth be stopped and the whole world be accountable to God. For by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. The design of the law was to reveal to us our sinfulness and our need for forgiveness. And then the scripture comes in in the gospel and reveals to us that the only hope of forgiveness is in Christ Jesus, the spotless and perfect sacrifice that he who was sinless would die bearing our sin on his own body 
so that when, when he would bear our sin, uh, his perfect righteousness would be counted for us. So that, so that, in a sense, the way that it talks about in Colossians, a certificate of debt, if you were to have a book, and on the day of judgment, the books will be opened, and everyone will be judged for deeds done in the body. You go to the page that says Jason on there. My name. That page that would have accounted all deeds done in the body, to which I would then be judged. The scripture says that certificate of debt was nailed to the cross so that when my name would be looked up for the purposes of judging my deeds done in the body, it's not there. Hmm. So where is my name? Go on over to another book, the Lamb's Book of Life. And by the grace of God, you look through that book and find that name. And that's why my name written in that book, the good shepherd of the sheep, calls his own by name. And they follow. Oh, what a grace. But listen, so we see, we see this unfold. And, and the persecution comes. And, and we see that Paul's ready. He does not know how it's going to unfold. He doesn't know what his role, as usual, he's ready to give his defense. Paul, 18, uh, verse 14 he was about to open his mouth and explain what's going on and look at a turnabout takes place. It says in verse 14, Gallio said to the Jews, he just cut them off. Don't even need your defense. Just cut them off. If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. It's a question about words, names, and your own law. See to it yourself. I refuse to judge these matters. But worse than that, not only do, do we see that the pro council stops the attack, it seems the prosecutor is suddenly attacked. Okay? Now, follow with me. In the church, uh, uh, initially the synagogue, Paul is speaking, one of those in the synagogue who comes to follow Christ was Crispus, who was the leader of the synagogue. Because he becomes a follower of Christ, he seems to have lost his leadership in the synagogue. And so they pass it over to another guy named Sosthenes. Well, if you're going to follow that guy, you go with him next door, we're getting our own guy. And so Sosthenes is now the, the leader of this group of people, and he comes forward on behalf of the synagogue of the Jews, makes these accusations... What is his goal? To get Paul to suffer harm. What happens? Verse 16. It says, And he, that's Gallio, drove them from the tribunal, which means he ordered them to leave. Now listen, I will say this a lot. Speculation is of little value, but it's almost impossible for us to stop it, okay? Because our minds just keep going. It, the nature of these kinds of circumstances, please understand, uh, we don't have anything like this. You would go to the marketplace, and, and in a place in the marketplace, in the Agora, was a, a stage where on a particular day of the week or month, this, this man would sit and he would pass judgments on disputes and issues. And, and it would often get pretty energetic. And so they would say, look, this is what he's done. And when he says, no, I'm not going to hear it, the normal tendency of men when they're told I'm not going to hear it is, okay, sir, thank you for your time. Is that what you see taking place around the world these days? What seems to be the tendency of man? You're gonna listen. You're gonna, you know. Things get stirred up, and that was not, it's not unique to our time. And so that's why when it says he drove them, he had to say, all right, guys, get them out of here. And it seems that they were still so agitating and thinking they could sway them. Remember, that same kind of agitation was successful against Pilate. For Pilate to agree 
to the punishment and crucifixion of Jesus. Didn't work here. <laughs> On this occasion, the guy who was the prosecutor, they grab hold of that guy. And they beat him senseless. And so this is what, what, it, what it says here. He drove them, and they all see Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. And you know what, this, what Gallio does while they're beating this guy? Mm. Next. Yeah. Keep going, but just keep it down. Next. You know, just not a care. But please note this. In the power of God, Psalm 716 says, His mischief, the, the wicked doer, returns on his own head, and on his own skull, his violence descends. God's able to make things turn about and happen how you didn't expect them to. Psalm 9, 9 verse 16, the Lord has made himself known. He has executed judgment. The wicked are snared in the works of their own hand. They went in there with the intent to get Paul beaten and arrested, and when they leave the place, Paul just cruises out. And Sosthenes, he's the one who gets beaten. But here's what I find so interesting about it. I, you know, I wish that we had more details. But God has not been pleased to give us those details. But we do have at least this. And I speak here, uh, the probable salvation accomplished. Listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians. Paul will be writing this letter to the Corinthian church. He says this, Paul, by the will of God, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, and our brother Sosthenes. It is highly probable that this man, who, who was an enemy and who chose, who tried to get them to turn against Paul, at some point God took one who was an enemy and made him a friend. Which would be interesting because that's exactly what happened with Paul. Paul was a brutalizing enemy and God made him a friend. You know? Now listen, people will like to speculate all they do. And, and look, you give commentators a, a, a journal to write and they'll fill it up with all kinds of imaginary sweetness. But the, what probably happened is uh, when he was beaten and injured, Paul probably visited him. They probably took him some food and showed him love and that love swayed his heart. Do we know that that's what happened? They may have. They may not have. Why can't we just sit back and say, I don't know what practical circumstances God used, but again, God took one who was opposed, one who was a denier, one who was a declared enemy, and he showed mercy on him. He poured out his grace. He poured by his spirit his love into his heart, and he made him a friend. And so Sosthenes is the one who sees problems going on in the church uh, uh, there, and he go, seemed likely is the one who went to Paul with a bunch of Chloe's people and reported, these are the problems that are going on there, and they go back. So Sosthenes is now seemingly a wonderful servant of God. Okay, we're going to have to go a bit faster, God willing. He, now, we see he, t he waits a little in order to uh, establish a good foundation. We know that he was there a year and six months. And then it says in verse 18, after this, he stayed many days longer than took leave of the brothers. One of the reasons he would want to stay uh, uh, for a long time, if he could, is because he wanted to lay a good foundation. As he says in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 and following, of his ministry there. According to the grace of God that was given me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. He wanted to make sure that they had a solid foundation before he left. Because there was such confusion and enmity between the Jewish community and the new growing church community, he wanted to make sure they understood the gospel. And they understood the blood of Christ and what it accomplished. And so he lays that foundation and he goes on to say this. Um, 
to the church of God in, where am I? There I am. Uh, Laid a foundation so someone else is building upon it. So now that I've left, you have other teachers who are there and even other visiting teachers who are coming in from outside. Let each one take care how he builds on it. Everyone who comes to you, whatever they teach, they're responsible for what they do. But note this, verse 11, no one can lay a foundation other than the one that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Wonderful statement. So he stayed there for many days. Yeah, remember, it's, it's going to say momentarily that he, when he left, he took with, it, with him Priscilla and Aquila, which it's interesting that it notes that he took with him Priscilla and Aquila because it likely means he left behind temporarily Timothy and Silas. Again, not an uncommon thing. Paul comes into a place, uh, problems arise or circumstances, and, and he gets sent out, he gets beaten, they, they focus their ire on him. But for those that have come to faith, God will oft leave Timothy, Titus, Silas behind to continue to build them up, to continue to give them some instruction and some guidance. But his desire was to see them solid and because there were many of them. Go on with me also. I want to show you briefly a, a tradition of fidelity. There's not much that can be unfolded about this. And I like the fact that it, it, it doesn't put too much emphasis on this. Because these are things that will ultimately fall away as time goes by. They're, they're Jewish traditions and Jewish practices that come out of the law. But it says that when he left there and he went to Cancria, that he had his hair cut because he was under a vow. Now that all probably sounds really strange to us, but for the Jews, they had something called a Nazarite vow. For a Nazarite vow, you may be uh, acquainted with uh, Samson. You may be acquainted with uh, uh, John the Baptist. Right? And we're aware of Samson and he grew his hair long. What would happen is when somebody committed to a Nazarite vow, during that vow, they could not, as it says in number six, they could not at any point cut their hair. And they could not have any uh, alcoholic beverages or anything that, that uh, the grape, raisin, seed or skin, anything that was associated with that. So it was an utter self-denial of certain things, not all of which was necessarily dangerous or evil or could be abused, but a season of self-denial in consecration to God. Sometimes it would be in seeking God, God's favor and strength and assistance. Sometimes it would be in response to God in thankfulness, but they would commit to this. Generally, it's said that uh, the minimum that someone would commit to a Nazarite vow would be a month. Because literally, if, uh, if, you're not, if you do a Nazarite vow for a week, and you don't cut your hair for a week, that's not all that significant. Things haven't changed all that much in, in a week's span. And some would do it significant periods of time, a year longer. Now, I don't know what Paul's vow was. It may have been as simple as, look, God, you have said that you are going to be with me and that you are going to protect me from harm uh, while I am here in Corinth. As long as I am here in Corinth, I'm going to vow of consecration to you. I'm going to live with restraint and self-denial in these areas. Because as soon as he leaves Corinth, he then cuts his hair as soon as he gets out there. Then he soon travels to Jerusalem where he would offer an ordinary sacrifice. But just this, just this simple idea where he would say to himself, and, I, and listen, I press this on no one, but we do see this. The scripture urges this, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. We live in an age of self-indulgence. And I'm not talking about Lent season and, and, and specific calendary things, but there can be a, a, a healthy expression of of self-restraint, where someone might say, they're not bound to it by anything, but I'm not going to, for one month, turn on the television. Or I'm not going to, for one month, some, I've often heard some people have chocolate. 
But sometimes that's a little mixed thing. They, they think that they can keep their diet better if they make it a Christian vow. So, I, you know, the mixed motives, God only knows the heart. Um, but, but, but sometimes it is nice to, 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 to remind ourselves we can live without this. And we can live without this. And maybe if we find ourselves becoming a bit too attached to something, say, you know what, I'm, I, I, I'm going to just, by the grace of God, I'm going to set that aside for a month so that I know that it, it doesn't have grip on me, that I'm enjoying it for my good, but it doesn't own me. I don't want anything to have mastery over me. And, and so we see something of that. And then lastly, what a, a trust in God's firm plans. God said that he would keep him. God said that he would be with him. Even when he's getting ready to leave Ephesus, he says this in verse 21, and I end with this. But on taking leave from them, he said, I will return if God wills. As James said, we live and we travel and we move and we make a profit if God wills. Anything that doesn't take into account the will of God, all such boasting is evil. And so I love this, this simple reality, if God wills. If God wills, I might get stoned. Pelted with stones, in case you misunderstand the phrase. Uh, if God wills, I might get beaten. If God wills, I won't get beaten no matter how much they hate me. You know, if God wills, I'm going to reach Jerusalem by ship. If God wills, there's going to be another shipwreck. Because Paul was in multiple shipwrecks and multiple imprisonments. But he came to realize this, and so, so strengthening and comforting, particularly in the midst of that trial, if God wills, everything happens by the will of God. And so I look to him, and I persevere. He's unfolding his purposes. Those doing wicked against me and him permitting it, he's going to bring them to judgment. In granting me endurance, he's going to strengthen my character and resolve. He's going to humble me. He's going to make me despair of life itself so that I might lean more on him. Whatever, I can trust God unfolding his will. All right, our time is more than completed, so let me pray. Uh, for a review of what we've considered today, it's right there on your outline. Please do pray and uh, reread this passage looking at these things in light of what we've considered today. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you that we can spend time in your word and we thank you for the richness of it. Lord God, you are faithful. You are powerful. You're not bound by the wicked intent of men. You're not bound by the weather or circumstance. Indeed, everything answers to you. And Lord, we thank you that we can have that confidence that uh, when we do look around and we think things are uh, out of control and we surely think many have lost their way, Lord, you are um, patiently unfolding your eternal purposes and your ways are not our ways and your thoughts are not our thoughts. But Lord, we thank you that you've given us your son and you've given us your word so that in the midst of all of the trials and tribulations in the midst of the days that you've allotted to us. We know what you would have us believe. We know how you would have us live. Lord, we pray that all of the things of this world that you have given us to enjoy, um, that they would not have mastery over us because none of it endures. All of it fades. And then soon we do as well. The only thing that matters is what do, endures to eternal life. And we thank you for our hope that is so founded upon God. And so we pray, God, that as we have however many days that you have designed and allotted for each one of us, we pray that we would render and give to you those days and you would use us for your praise, use us for your kingdom, use us to proclaim your gospel, use us to bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen.